a very good evening to you all the respected audience the budding researchers students myself professor atish kumar chattopadhyay uh, in the department of allied health science brain wire university kolkata so today uh, we assembled here in a very august occasion that is the commemoration of 150th birth anniversary of sir upendranath brahmachari frms frs one of the most outstanding scientists in physiology and medical science this country has ever produced today we have uh, very distinguished speakers uh, in this in this uh, uh, seminar and uh, now uh, i would request uh, professor amar kumar chandra a leading physiologist uh, of the country served in different positions of sap including presidency our revered honorable president of the physiological society of india uh, to 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 deliver uh, to welcome uh, our audience and the participants thank you professor chattopadhyay good evening to all the members of the physiological society of india and other dignitaries as president of the physiological society of india i welcome you for all the physiological society of india has been organizing the 150th birth anniversary of sir upendranath brahmachari a legendary indian scientist as well as a pioneer medical practitioner during his time he was born on this very day that is 19 december in the year 1873 in jamalpur bihar he is known for his great discovery of the medicine named urea stibamine for the cure of kala jor a disease that killed millions of people in assam and west bengal including odisha the disease is caused by a protozoan lismania donovan it causes visceral lismaniosis urea stibamine is synthesized from antimony in addition to india the drug was was also used widely in greece france and china in pre antibiotic era urea stibamine was thus a significant addition in arsenal specific medicine in spite of his strong interest during student life in mathematics and chemistry he studied in calcutta medical college kolkata and completed mb followed by md in 1902 which was a rare degree at that time later he did phd in physiology from university of calcutta on the topic hemolysis that still considered as a great work dr brahmachari started his career in professional medical service in 1899 initially he joined in calcutta medical college and then in dhaka medical college and hospital in 1905 he was appointed as teacher in medicine and physician in campbell medical school kolkata and carried out most of his pioneering work on kalajor besides his strong academic accomplishment he has great interest for the physiology and for the physiological society of india he was the founder member as well as vice president of the physiological society of india the society was established in 1934 where eminent physiologist professor sc mohanobis was the first president sir nilotan sarkar sir kedarnath das dr vidhan chandra roy and dr h wilson were the members as well as vice president of the physiological society after his retirement in 1927 Dr Brahmachari joined in Campbell Medical College as professor of tropical diseases he was also the honorary professor of biochemistry in the university college of science calcutta he has lost his eternal life in february 1946 these are my just a short statement after myself there are a number of pioneering work work on kalajor who knows very well about the bibliography of 
डॉक्टर सैल उपेंद्रनाथ ब्रह्मचारी आई हैंडिंग ओवर द माइक टू डॉक्टर चट्टोपाध्याय फॉर दिस डिस्कशन थैंक यू थैंक यू ऑल thank for initiating the discussion with some unknown information about the physiological society of india and also sir upendranand mambuchari and his association with this uh with this organization uh now i would request uh, professor krishna roy a very senior teacher and scientist Uh, of physiology in the west bengal education service uh, former principal of bethun college kolkata to present her talk on sir upendranath brahmachari madam thank you dr chatrapathy for the nice introduction actually the eminent speakers two eminent speakers of today's uh, session will discuss the total life and scientific contribution of sarivin brambhuchari i will mention only some untouched areas already uh, professor amu chandru has mentioned that uh, even brambhuchari was associated with physiological society of india but unfortunately many of us in the physiology community are not aware that dr brambhuchari had did his phd in physiology in 1904 on rbc red blood cell and i came to know about him when i was posted in hugli motion college alma mater of sarivin brambhuchari in 2011 and i am very happy to say the physiology department of hugli motion college was named after him as even brambhuchari building and the other thing uh Dr. Yuen Brambhuchari not only was associated with Physiological Society of India, he donated much for the society. It is also to be remembered. Now I will uh, tell you uh, an important thing. In the uh, last century, in the 40s of the last century, whenever a psychoanalyst used the term uh, Kalazor, most of the people used two terms. One is Udiastibamin and the other is even brambhuchari so such was the acceptability and popularity level of sir even brambhuchari in the diden society as a person upendranath uh, bore many shadows in his character already mentioned by professor chandru that he was very proficient in mathematics chemistry physiology diden modern medicine and uh, not only that uh, he was an ardent and devoted researcher he carried out his research work in a small dingy room in campbell medical school once he was offered a small room in the rajabaja science college newly developed uh, but then the nobel laureate cv raman objected to this proposal and so he was denied all kinds of support from scientific fraternity and with a meager financial support and very uh, ample laboratory support he carried out his research work and discovered the magic drug following paul ehrlich's magic bullet containing heavy metal of arsenic he followed anti organic compound of uh, antimony so that will be discussed in detail by our today's speaker i am not going into detail of this uh, but another thing is to be mentioned that unlike his predecessor indian scientists like jc uh, bosch or acharya profula chandra de meghna chaha shottin bosch he did not go abroad for high scientific studies on the contrary he never supported the indian freedom fighters and always supported the britishers in colonial india uh we can remember that in 1905 when lord karjan divided bengal he was then posted in calcutta from dhaka medical school and the, uh, all throughout the people were very agitated but upendranath brambhuchari was unperturbed he was carrying out his research work on malaria or cotton fever or primary studies on uh, leishmaniasis 
uh, he was not no awarded Nobel Prize, although his name was nominated twice in 1929 and 1942. He did not go abroad any time, and no Britisher offered uh, nominated his name, although the Britisher celebrated him with many medals or prizes. Uh, and I will conclude my uh, introduction with a real life event uh, surrounding Shukumare, the famous creative personality of the last century and father of Shotojitri. He was a victim of Kalazar and he died in 1923, uh, much after discovery of Uriya you know, one thing, whenever a drug is discovered, its trial, clinical trial is made only on poor downtrodden people, slum dwellers. And so it was applied on the hospital patients and also the workers in coal mines or tea gardens in Asham, uh, Odisha, Bihar, etc. But never on a person coming from elite society. So during uh, the disease on Shukumar Ray, Neither the British doctors nor the Indian native doctors used Uriastibamin. On the contrary, they used Neostibusan formed in Zanman. That was the tragedy because if he was, he could have used Uriastibamin, life of Shukumar Ray could have been prolonged and we could have been enriched with his creative writing. And finally, I will quote Oshima Chatterjee once said that. In the 30s of the last century, in the scientific fraternity, there was one Mahatma. He was neither Gandhi or Patel or Jinnah. He was none other than the great grandfather scientist, Yuen Brombochari, whose brain was always filled with numerous novel scientific ideas. And it's very unfortunate that Indians uh, do not remember Yuen Brombochari with due regard and devotion. Only a street in Calcutta, Loudoun Street, is named after him. And the building of physiology department in Hugli Motion College and another Brombuchari Award has been uh, started by CSR from 2012. So it is nice that Physiological Society has arranged this uh, commemorative seminar. And thank you all uh, for the allow me to offer this small introduction. Thank you, Professor Roy, for uh, your excellent uh, talk, touching the aspect of Sir Upen Brahmacharya's uh, various struggle and, and the history of that particular time. Thank you very much. Uh, now I would humbly uh, request uh, our uh, guest of honor, Dr. Samuel Rai, an eminent immunologist of this country, FNA, FSC, FA, FSC, and uh, ICMR Emeritus Scientist, Jesse Bosch Fellow, former Vice Chancellor of Kujbir Panchanan Barma University, to uh, deliver his talk on Sir Upen Brahmachari. Rajan? Rajan, slide, because I sent the slide yesterday. Yeah, just presentation. Should I start now? Sir. Yeah. First of all, I thank organizers for giving me this opportunity. Uh, it's a tribute to the legendary Indian scientist, Sir Upendranath Brahmachari. And uh, the title of my talk is Sir Upendranath Brahmachari, The Scientist Saved Millions. And I also talk about science behind the medicine of Kalazar. And finally, my tribute to the 
tribute to uh, Utanana Brahmachari. Next one, please. Next one. Okay. Uh, so, early history of unknown disease that started in 19, 1824 uh, in Joshua. And uh, basically, this is a picture of uh, at the backdrop, you can see the Fort William, the river Ganges. And uh, Calcutta was basically the epicenter of Kalajar research that time. Next one. Okay, if you look at the uh, how epidemics actually spread in the different parts of Indian subcontinent, it started with Joshore around 1824, and then it spread to Bardwan district. Sometimes it is called as Bardwan fever, and from there it moved to Garo Hills in Assam. And from there to Nogan district in Assam, and then to Tezpur, to Mongoldoi, to Punia, to Naxalbari, to Gohati, and then to the rest of the country, this is started to spread. And uh, antimonials was discovered in 1921-22 by UN Brahmachari, and it was extensively used. But if we still uh, look for the recent field isolates, we can still see about 70% of the 78% of the recent clinical isolates are still resistant to antimonial and uh, spread of the re spread of the resistance in part due to genetic exchange. So basically the resistance in the field isolates still prevailing and so therefore antimony is not uh, no longer in use in our country but it is still is a drug in Africa and certain other parts of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa where Kalajar is still there. So antimony resistance is becoming a big problem in our country. So therefore, many other new medicines are coming in the picture. Next one. Now, the name of Kalajar is also known as Asham fever. And in medical journalism, Kalajar or visceral lishpanaisis continues to refer to as the Asham fever. The name of Asham was crafted into a disease. On the right side, you can see a picture. This is taken from the uh, India Survey Office around 1897 uh, in, in Mongoldoi. All these people are destined to die because they are having Kalazar. And Kalazar is a kind of uh, different names. And one of the interesting name is Shankari Bimari or government disease. As British has started to develop the railway tracks all over the country, so along the line of communication, this is also started to spread. So people who started calling it as a Sharkari Bimari or government disease. And it's also known as visceral lishmanisis and also known as the Dandam fever and Kalazar or Asham fever is basically different names of Kalazar that commonly used in different time and different time point. Next one. Now, when the Kalazar was kind of quite rampant in, in Asham, Ronald Ross was asked to um, go to Asham for the investigation of Kalazar. And then he gave a report to the government of India on the nature of Kalazar. But one thing he uh, failed to prove that Kalajar is not transmitted by the mosquitoes. So he made this statement that Kalajar at least not been transmitted by mosquitoes. That is the report that is submitted to the government of India. And if you read this book, Calcutta Chromosome by Amitabh, Amitabh Ghosh, basically it describes of life of uh, Ronald Ross in Calcutta and his work on the melody, a transmission, etc., like that. Next one, please. Now, this is one of the pictures in 1910, long before the discovery of pentavalent antimonials. 
Asham uh, in India, Kalajar patients, a group of men and women and children in 1910, they are kind of, if they survive spontaneously, that's fine. Otherwise, they are destined to die because of a lot of complications that develop due to, due to Kalajar. And one of the most important thing that comes up is the immune suppression, severe anemia, and ultimately you they encounter a variety of secondary infections and ultimately die of hepatosplenomegaly mm. and many other related complications. Next one. Now, as I mentioned before, that the name of the disease is also Dandam fever. So one uh, uh, British soldier who was stationed in Dandam in the British cantonment there, and he was kind of had a fever, which is failed to respond to quinine or many other treatment that are available in those days. So the, fail, the patient failed to respond to all those treatment. And this patient was taken to the Royal Victoria Hospital in Nutley, where the patient died. And uh, from Royal, from Domdom to the Royal Victoria Hospital, the British soldier, and uh, nameless in medical archive, unwittingly gave his name for science. William Leishman is the physician, took up the case and post-mortem investigation. And he had earlier worked with African trypanosomiasis. And he thought this is a case of sleeping sickness or African trypanosomiasis uh, in India. Actually, that was not his correct assumption. So that was absolutely turned out, turned out to be wrong. Next one, please. Now, this is a letter written by Charles Donovan, who was a professor of physiology at Madras Medical College. Charles Donovan was born in Calcutta in 1863, did his elementary school in Dehradun and Missouri, and his father was in the judicial service in India. After his school education, he went to Dublin, studied medicine, and came back and joined as a, as a professor of physiology at Madras Medical College. On 16th of July, 1903, he wrote a letter to Major Ross. You know that Ronald Ross was the major arbitrator of parasitical research in the world at that time. And he came up with some kind of distinct uh, tiny dots in the phagocytic cells or macrophages. And he sought his assistance of Ronald Ross to identify this, this parasite, which is actually present in the phagocytic cells or macrophages in the bone marrow, spleen, liver, and many other parts of the body. And he sought his assistance from Major Ross to identify this, this parasite. Next one. In the same year, uh, Leishman also wrote a letter to Ross, uh, asking Ronald Ross to identify this parasite, also send his slide, whatever he did in the post-mortem investigation. So Ronald Ross actually compared these two slides and he came to a point that these parasites are not present in the red cell. They are selectively present in the WBC or uh, in, in phagocytic cells or macrophages. And he tried to propose that this could be a new parasite. Next one. Now, two successive papers were published in British Medical Journal in 1903 on the possibility of the occurrence of trypanosomiasis India by, by Leishman. And in the same issue, another paper on the possibility of the occurrence of trypanosomiasis. This is a note from Charles Donovan, on the, on the, also in the British Medical Journal on 1903, and both the paper describing that something new parasite uh, must have been discovered. So there's then the controversy started, who will be the discoverer of this parasite. Next one. So the Ross was in Calcutta that time. You can see that this building is still there in PG Hospital. And if you go there, you can still see. And uh, Lady Ross and his assistant, I think Koda Box, many other people. And basically, he studied all the malaria transmission in BART. So a lot of BARTs here and there. So Ronald Ross took up this case and uh, named these parasites as Lishman Donovan bodies and taxonomically designated as Lishmania Donovani. And he published also another paper in British Medical Journal in 93, 
by designating this new parasite as Leishman Donovan bodies and taxonomically as the Leishmania Donovan parasite. Next one, please. <clears throat> now, this is an interesting paper published in Nature 1951 from Calcutta by Professor P. C. Gupto of Calcutta School of Tropical Medicine and N. N. Dasgupto and D. L. Bhattacharya of University of Calcutta. The first electron micrograph picture of the Lishmania parasites that was published in Nature in 1951 in, from, from Calcutta. Next one. Now come to the discoveries of the chemotherapeutics in the world. If you look at the discovery of the chemotherapeutics uh, from the beginning, so if we start with the Paul Ehrlich Salvarsan, which is anti-syphilitic drug, and awarded Nobel Prize in 1903, although he received the Nobel Prize uh, for research in immunology, but not for the discovery of Salvarsan. This is an anti-syphilitic drug. Then if you think about the second chemotherapeutic in the world, that is after Paul Ehrlich Salvarsan, that is Brahmochari Sirius Tibamin. And if you also note it down, if you note it, you see it was discovered long before discovery of penicillin. So Alexander Fleming, the penicillin, Nobel Prize in 1945. Then Domong, the sulfonamides, Nobel Prize in 1939. And Salzman, Waxman, Streptomycin, 1952, but it was discovered in 1943 uh, when it was kind of extensively used for treatment of tuberculosis. Now, if you look at the history of chemotherapy, starting from Salvarsan, and uh, the first one got Nobel Prize, third one got Nobel Prize, fourth and fifth, but Uriastibamin, uh, although it saved countless people of our countrymen, it was although nominated, but he did not get the result credit for discovery of pentavalent, organic pentavalent antimonials for treatment of Kalazar. Next one. Now, this is a kind of some personal dates of uh, Ewen Brahmachari, the forgotten saint of Calcutta. So he was born on December 19, 1873 in Jamalpur, Bihar. And, uh, received his BA degree in chemistry and mathematics from Hooghly Mohishin College and MA in chemistry from Presidency College. Then did his medical education at Medical College Calcutta and PhD physiology, 1904. First physician at Campbell Medical School Calcutta, discovered urea stevamine, carried out extensive studies from 1921 to 1925 and invested with knighthood by His Excellency Viceroy of India, 1935, and breath his last on February 6, 1946. So Brahmachari, from his uh, kind of, you can see from his educational background, he had the unique blend of chemistry and medicine. So therefore, this unique uh, knowledge really helped him to discover this new drug and its successful application for treatment of Kalaza. Next one, please. Now, largely convinced by Paul Ehrlich, Paul Ehrlich, uh, he discovered Salvarsan, where he used the arsenicals. And instead of arsenic, he used pentavalent. It was pentavalent antimonials. Initially, trivalent antimonials were used, but it was extremely cardiotoxic. But Brahmachari actually prepared organic uh, antimonials for treatment of Kalajar, which reduced the toxicity to a large extent. And it is highly soluble. So therefore, largely convinced by Paul Early, uh, he actually discovered the urea stevamine. Starting with paraminophenyl arsenic acid, he discovered urea stevamine for treatment of treatment of Kalazar. Next one, please. Now, the first paper published in 1922, Indian Journal of Medical Research, Chemotherapy of Antimonial Compounds in Kalazar Infection. And this basically all this uh, structure that he had really showed in, in this paper. And also a lot of preclinical toxicity was carried out in animal model and showing that hardly it has any toxicity on different organs. In, and so therefore, in one hand, people are dying. In the other hand, he could show that it is relatively uh, non-toxic in animal model. 
So directly he used this medicine for treatment of Kalazar with great deal of success. Next one, please. Now, it is uh, Brahmachari's own paper published in Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene in 1941 on introduction of inorganic antimony in the treatment of Kalazar. Basically, inorganic antimony he converted into organic antimony. So after introduction of this new drug, in Assam from 1925 to 1936, number of uh, cases started to decrease dramatically and also number of deaths also started to decrease dramatically in Assam from 1925 to 1936. Next one. So this is an article I wrote many years ago in Indian Journal of uh, History of Science. Even Brahmachari, Scientific Achievement, Nomination for Nobel Prize, Fellowship to the Royal Society London. And this is the advertisement in those days of Urias Tivamin. And this is a kind of tentative structure of Urias Tivamin. Although there are some controversies about this general structure of this uh, pentavalent antimonial, which was ultimately used for treatment of Kalazar, there is a lot of... Uh, discussion and uh, on this issue what is the exact structure of antimonial compounds that was used for treatment of Kalazar. Next one please. So this is an article recently published in India Science uh, profile of the month Kupendranath Brahmachari. The making of Messiah uh, basically describing his experiences everything and if you have the privilege kindly read this article and you get a great deal of information about the discovery, its application, complexities, problems, etc. etc. Next one, please. He also uh, designed uh, some kind of syringe for continuous intravenous administration of urea stibamin. Uh, so it is, he designed it himself. Uh, for continuous administration of the drug uh, to, the, to the patients. Next one. So, uh, so after the discovery of uh, antimonial compound, pentavalent antimonial compound, H. E. Short, who actually heading the Kalazar Commission, he worked with Brahmachari in 1924. And what he wrote, this is from his, uh, he died. Uh, sometime in 87 or so, from his uh, obituary, some some of the thing that I came, I, I read it, that 90% death rate to 90% cure rate. So about 90% death converted into 90% cure rate after the introduction of anti-pentavalent antimonial compound for treatment of Kalazar. And AC Short really worked with him in Asham for many years for treating the Kalajar patients. Next one, please. So this is one of my poems on Ode to Lishman Donovan Bodies. We have the infestimal human pathogenic parasite born somewhere in Africa, widened our base to the Victorian subcontinent, epidemics blossomed with countless deaths. Gunlet of suffering came under the scanner to gentlemen Dr. Lashman and Dr. Donovan made us visible as living objects, named as Lishman Donovan bodies. Indian gentleman, Dr. Ivan Brahmachari, designed a magic bullet named Uriya Stibamin, choreographed a formidable attack, driven us to the verge of extinction. Like the Battle of Alamo, a few others survived, empowered with elaborate emoji, Evolved as antimony resistant Lishman Donovan bodies, endowed with divergent and highly infective ability, rarefied with new dystrophic transformants, we became a different clan in a strict Darwinian sense. Let others explore what we became. Actually, we started studying the mechanism of the antimony resistance in Lishmania parasites, and uh, we see a lot of changes in the drug transporters, lot of changes in the metabolic enzymes, and variety of changes that happens, and the mutation uh, also, uh, and different transporters, there are mutations as well. 
So they completely, they become a different clan and their infectivity is very high and uh, their uh, generational cycle is, is much faster. They replicate much faster and therefore they can cause a very aggressive infection if someone is infected with the antimony resistant leishmanial parasites. So this is a kind of distinct clan from the sensitive parasites versus antimony resistant parasites. Next one. So Indian Medical Research Memoir uh, in August 1932, reports of the Kalazar Commission. British government set up a Kalazar Commission. And in 1932, H.E. Short, director of Kalazar Commission, appointed by the government of India, stated, we found Uriastibamin is eminently safe, reliable drug. And in seven years, we treated some thousands of cases of Kalazar and saw thousands more treated in treatment centers. The acute fulminating type character of peak period of an epidemic responds to treatment extraordinarily promptly with an almost dramatic cessation of fever, diminution of the size of the spleen, and return to normal and conditions uh, and normal condition of health. So this is a glorious recommendation given by H. U. Short, uh, who was heading the Kalazar Commission that time. Next one. Brahmachari, with unique blend of his clinical eye, he also discovered another variety of uh, kind of variant of Kalazar, the patients after clinical cure of Kalazar. The parasites somehow escape from visceral organ to the skin. And even 25 years after treatment of Kalazar, which is clinically cured, and one can develop this uh, lesion on the skin and this is Brahmachari discovered it, and that was published in Indian Medical Gazette in 1922. This is called post kalazar dermal lesionosis, and it can develop at any point of time, even after 25 years after clinical cure of kalazar, one can develop post kalazar dermal lesionosis, and this is continues to be a problem in Bihar, and these tiny uh, lesions are full of parasites. If sunfly bites and they can transmit this parasite, infective parasites to the new individual and can develop the disease. Although, although the Kalajar cases has reduced considerably in Bihar, which is the epicenter of Kalajar, but uh, two weeks ago I was there and a lot of PKDL patients they are getting uh, nowadays. Uh, those had a clinical cure uh, after treatment, not only with antimonial, but also other variety of newer variety of drugs like miltofacin or amputacin tyrosin B. So even today, these kind of patients are coming. Since they are kind of, uh, apparently they, are, they have no problem, but only problem is that they can, can act as a reservoir for transmission of the parasites. But they are otherwise, they have no problem. So they are kind of reluctant to go to the clinics. And second problem is that to treat these PKDL cases are, are it requires a prolonged treatment. So therefore, it is very difficult for the people working in the field to go to the hospital, get the treatment, etc., etc. So therefore, this is a kind of condition Bihar is now encountering. And if these patients are not treated, then Kalazar can come up at any point of time. Next one, please. Now, glorious achievement versus the sad saga of uh, with the life of Brahmachari. Next one. <clears throat> In 1939, Leonard Rogers who was a professor, who was the director of Calcutta School of Tropical Medicine. And Aren Chopra, who was a professor of pharmacology at Calcutta School of Tropical Medicine. Rogers wrote an article in Nature in 1939, just quoting few words from Aren Chopra. Although uh, in 1920, Aren Chopra, professor of pharmacology in the School of Tropical Medicine, Calcutta, reported that preparation vary widely in antimony content and to be of uncertain composition to be of uncertain in composition. This very statement 
that Arun Chopra made. Arun Chopra was a pharmacologist, so he is not a uh, man who can really show the antimony content from base to base. His 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 discipline is not this one at all. So he actually made this unguarded statement, and that Leonard Rogers mentioned in Nature. So this is a kind of uh, I would say that this is not the real scientific spirit that Arun Chopra showed because. He has not done those experiments, but he reported something, a, maybe a casual remark. But actually, Leonard Rogers wrote this very sentence in Nature article in 1939. Next one, please. So, 1940, uh, Meghnath Shah wrote a letter to Birbal Shahani, you know, famous botanist. Uh, we know that the Birbal Shahani Institute of Tali of Botany in Lucknow. Both of them are members of the Royal Society. Shaha planned, uh, he discussed with Birbal Shahani disclosing his plan to nominate Brahmachari for the membership of the Royal Society. And uh, J.L. Simonson, a British chemist, agreed, agreed to be a proposer. The seconder was Meghnath Shaha from personal knowledge and also Krishnan, Birbal Shahani, Stephens, Framer, Samuel, many other people also recommended from the personal knowledge and from the general knowledge, Gibson, Donan, and Leddingham, they gave their recommendation from the general knowledge. 1943, A.V. Hill, we all physiologists know that he's a man actually discovered related to the gas transport. A.V. and Hill, he was the chairman of the council of the Royal Society, visited India. Hill was seemingly influenced by the Rogers nature article and Shaha wrote a strong letter to Rogers concerning the wrong impression on Brahmachari's work on Uriastimami. Rogers has never replied to Shaha's challenge. 1944, Hill was convinced by Shaha's argument and had a discussion with Henry Dell. All physiologists know that the Dell separators. Henry Dale was the president of the Royal Society. So both of them had a discussion, Abby Hill and, and Henry Dale. So after Rogers Brahmachari controversy was over, Simonson's opinion was disastrous. As a chemist, I do not think that Brahmachari has any claim to election. Later, he practically withdrew his statement. So initially, uh, he uh, agreed, he proposed, and then he made a statement that Brahmachari, uh, Brahmachari, as a chemist, I do not think Brahmachari has any claim in election. Dell and Hill were still interested to explore Brahmachari's chance. Then 1944, H.W. Gray stated that there are some controversies about the nature of compound, but he continued, this criticism does not detract from the credit due to Brahmachari for the discovery of this useful drug. In 1945, Brahmachari's case remained suspended and 1946, Brahmachari died. Next one, please. I'll excuse me for a moment. Somebody is giving a bell. Sorry. So this is a letter that Shaha wrote that about this uh, uh, use of ureostibamine and how it has really saved countless lives. And it is his own handwriting uh, to the Royal Society, how useful this drug was and how it has really saved countless people in our, uh, in our country. So this is his handwritten statement that he, that was, uh, published in Science and Culture, January to February, 2014. Next one, please. So nomination for the Nobel Prize. So he was nominated in 1929 and also in 1942. Uh, he was nominated a couple of times. But actually, uh, his nominators are all from Calcutta. Actually, he never, uh, as Krishna was mentioning, he, he didn't go abroad. So he was not much linked with the uh, 
with the people outside uh, the India. Like he never visited, I don't know how many times he visited UK or not, but he had less connection with the, with the British people outside India. So, but his recommenders were not that very strong. And some of the Calcutta-based scientists actually recommended his name. Next one, please. So we had a conference at IICB, 100 Years of Antimonials, an international conference. So CSR announces Brahmachari Award, and that was published in Hindu. So next one, please. So Kalajar continues to be a problem in our country. Synthesis of organic pentavalent antimonial by Brahmachari is a landmark discovery. Antimonial still in use for treatment of Kalajar in Africa. The company Alvar David in Calcutta, actually they supply uh, to African countries, this pentavalent antimonials. Story of Upanurad Brahmachari is the story of a forgotten man and forgotten genius of Indian science who saved millions and remembered only when the street in Calcutta that bears his name. The difference between the great and the ordinary is simple, that the ordinary thing they are great and the great thing they are ordinary. Perhaps that is how Brahmachari would have preferred it. Next one, please. So this is the Brahmachari oration uh, that was in IICB on March 14, uh, 2023. Professor Simon Croft from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He was the recipient of Brahmachari Award uh, this year. And you can see this Brahmachari's plaque. And this is the uh, NRS Medical College Hospital, one of the buildings where he actually did his outstanding discovery, Urias Tibami. So this is in IICB and Simon Croft here and some of my colleagues around uh, some of the People are working, those are working on Kalajar areas in, and some other colleagues standing here. So this is all I wanted to talk about. I think I should stop here. Thank you very much. So if you have any questions. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Rai for your nice and fascinating talk on on the work and life of and also the struggle of uh sir even brahmachari in which you have explained his research uh, the mechanism and everything uh, so uh, uh, thank you very much so are you inviting any question at this of moment course. If, you, if anybody has any question okay, I'll be happy okay. To so so if any question uh, in a very brief uh, uh, one or two questions, you can ask uh, uh, Professor Dr. Rai, who is an expert uh, in this uh, particular field. Any question? Okay. So now. Uh, I would request uh, our uh, today's speaker, uh, Dr. Kaushik Bharati, PhD, MIPHA, FRSPH, London. And uh, I, uh, I would very briefly uh, uh, sketch his uh, uh, outstanding achievements. Uh, Dr. Koushi Bharati is a uh, team lead COVID-19 research trackers at UNESCO New, uh, uh, here in New Delhi and a former consultant of WHO. He obtained his PhD in physiology with specialization in vaccinology from Calcutta School of Tropical Medicine, the same institute uh, uh, where uh, Sir uh, Brahmachari uh, also worked for some time. And a postdoctoral fellowship from Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, UK, specializing in immunology and molecular biology. He was formerly a scientist uh, at the National Institute of Immunology, New Delhi, and senior program, program officer at the Translational Health Science and Technology Institute, NCR Delhi. 
He was also a visiting professor in the Department of Physiology and Microbiology at Vidyasagar University, Midhapur. Besides academics, he has also a rich consultancy experience, having worked for Global Health Strategies, New York, USA, Sanofi Pasteur Live in France, the Policy Cure as Sydney, uh, and so on. And uh, his major research areas include virology and vaccinology and public health. He has published 102 uh, papers in reputed national and international journals and has also co authored a book entitled Basic Concepts in Immunology, which is very, very related to this field. He has delivered numerous invited lectures and national and international conferences, including Thailand, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Singapore, Indonesia, South Korea, Philippines, and many other countries. He is the editor-in-chief of South Asian Association of Physiologists Bulletin, Colombo, Sri Lanka, and chairman of SAP Research Committee. He is also editor-in-chief of the Journal of Clinical Genetics and Genomics, Windsor Berkshire. UK. He is on the peer review panel of 15 medical journals from India, UK, USA, the Netherlands, China, Indonesia, and other countries. He is also a PhD examiner of uh, University of Calcutta and Lincoln University. He is associated with 42 organizations across the globe. Notably, uh, he is a fellow of uh, that Royal Society of Public Health of London. He has received 16 awards for his research work from India, New Zealand, UK, and US. So now I would request uh, uh, Professor Dr. Bharti uh, to, to kindly deliver uh, uh, your talk on none other than Sir Upendranath Bombocheri. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Chattabadai, for the kind introduction. Can you see my slide and the pointer? Yes, it is visible. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to first of all thank the Physiological Society of India for kindly giving me this opportunity to deliver this talk. As you can see, I'll be talking out about Sir Yuen Brahmachari and his life and his science. So I've tried to intertwine his life events with his scientific contributions. First of all, uh, I would like to uh, trace the origin of his surname, Brahmachari. As you know, this is a very rare surname. So the story begins with Keshab Bharati and his claim to fame is that he initiated Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu into Shannas. So this story is around 500 years uh, from today because that's the time when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was around. And the uh, title Bharati came from the fact that he took sannyas under the Bharati sect of Sri Shankaracharya. And he also gave Diksha to his elder brother Gopal Mukhopadhyay, who subsequently renounced his family name Mukhopadhyay and became known as Gopal Bharati Brahmachari Thakur. With the passage of time, Bharati and Thakur were dropped, only the first name and the title Brahmachari remained. And Yuen Brahmachari was uh, in the ninth generation, uh, his descendant. So Yuen Brahmachari was born today in 1873 in a small village called Sardanga in Purbostali. This is in East uh, Bardhavan district. And his father was Dr. Nilmani Brahmachari, who was a renowned physician in Purbostali and worked for the Eastern Railways. And his mother, Saurabh Sundari Devi, was a homemaker. He married uh, Naniwala Devi uh, in the year 1898. He was just 25 years old at that time and was studying at the medical college. So they had two sons, Panindranath and Nirmal Kumar Brahmachari. 
This is Purvostali, a very picturesque place, as you can see, on the banks of the river Hugli. And Yuvan Brahmachari, you know, spent uh, much of his time here in his childhood. And here a school was named after, after his father. Uh, this says in Bengali, Purvostari Nirmali Brahmachari Institution, established in 1887. This is the school on the Google map. And it's located on the banks of the river Hugli. Nearby towns include Mayapur. This is uh, famous for the largest and the first ISKCON temple. Navadip is the birthplace of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Krishnanagar is also not too far away. His, uh, you know, reverence and his respect for his father is expressed here. Uh, he writes, to the sacred memory of my father, Dr. Nilmani Brahmachari, whose devotion to duty and nobility of character endeared him to all who knew him and whom I never knew to do an unjust act or cherish an unjust thought, and who still lives as the inspiring genius to guide me in my life. I dedicate this work as the humble tribute of a loving and grateful son. So you can see how grateful he was to his father for his guidance. And this work that he refers to is the, his studies in hemolysis, uh, that which uh, is based on his PhD thesis. Coming to his education, first the school and college education. As I mentioned that uh, Dr. Nilmani Brahmachari worked with the Eastern Railways. So uh, UN Brahmachari studied at the Eastern Railways Boys School in Jamalpur. This is in Bihar now, and he passed his entrance exam with credit, then came to Calcutta and joined the Hooghly College in Chinsura in British parlance or Chuchra as we call it in Bengali. So there could be two reasons why this college was called Hooghly College. Firstly, it was located on the banks of the river Hooghly. And secondly, it could be that it was the first college uh, to be, you know, established in the whole uh, district of Ugli. And this is how uh, this uh, college looked at that time. And I purpose, purposely used these old pictures just to give you a flavor of how these places, places were where he studied and worked during his time. And this college was established in 1836 by Mohammed Mohsin. And in its centenary year, that is 1936, uh, it was renamed as Hooghly Motion College uh, and, uh, you know, in honor of, of its founder. And uh, it was from here that in 1893, he passed his BA exam with double honors in mathematics and chemistry. In those days, you could get double honors. And even the science subjects were, uh, you know, uh, under fell under the Bachelor of Arts degree. And he stood first in mathematics, in fact, for which he was awarded the Thwaites Medal. After this, he moved to Presidency College. Uh, when it was founded way back in 1817, it was called Hindu College. Then much later in 1855, its name was changed to Presidency College of Bengal. And uh, you know now it has been upgraded to an university, as you know and it was established in 2010. And it was here that in 1894, he completed his master's degree in chemistry. So I, as his life unfolds, I just want to highlight that is, you know, he had a solid base in mathematics and chemistry with an advanced degree in chemistry. And this paid off later on in life when he was, you know, doing research and especially during the discovery of urea stevamine. So after gaining his master's in chemistry, uh, he switched uh, disciplines and joined me medical uh, college, Calcutta Medical College. So this was established way back in 1835 and was known as the Medical College Bengal. And this was in fact the first medical college to be established in the whole of Asia. And uh, this was established 22 years before the establishment of Calcutta University itself, which was established in 1857. That is the same year as the Shipoy Mutiny. Now, when uh, Medical College Bengal came within the purview 
of Calcutta Medical uh, of the Calcutta University, its name was changed to Calcutta Medical College. And it was known as Calcutta Medical College when Ewan Brahmachari studied there. In 1899, he completed his licensiate in medicine and surgery or LMS. The following year in 1900, he passed his MB exam. In those days, you didn't have MBBS. You just had, had Bachelor of Medicine, but all the subjects were taught under it. And in fact, he was so brilliant that he stood first, both in medicine as well as in surgery. For standing first in medicine, he was awarded the Goodyear Medal. And for standing first in surgery, he was awarded the McLeod Medal. And just to link this to his life story, you know, in, I mentioned earlier, he, was, he got married in 1898. He was studying his LMS at that time. You know, so he was, uh, you know, both... Uh, 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 having a family life as well uh, as he was a student as well. After this, he joined Presidency General Hospital, which is uh, uh, called as P uh, PG Hospital for short. And it was established way back in 1707, long time ago. And at that time, the, the teaching and the research wing was clubbed with the hospital wing and all of them were under one roof and it was until it not until 1954 that you know the research and teaching wing was separated from the hospital wing the former became known as ipgmer or institute of postgraduate medical education and research and the hospital wing became known as sskm hospital because the largest donor was set suklal karnani that's why it was named Seth Suklal Karnani Memorial Hospital or SSKM Hospital. And it was here that he completed his MD in 1902. And within two years, he was awarded his PhD in 1904. And the title of his thesis was Studies in Hemolysis. Now, I just want to highlight one thing. Even before he was awarded his MD, in 1901 itself, he got a job at the Dhaka Medical School. And, you know, he was started doing his research both in Dhaka as well as in Calcutta because his registration for his MD and PhD degrees was were under Calcutta University. And he was also doing research in Dhaka. So he was very busy at that time, shuttling back and forth from Dhaka and Calcutta. And, you know, that is why he got his PhD so quickly just after his MD. Coming to his medical career, uh, he, he uh, joined Dhaka Medical School in 1901 and stayed there till, till 1905, roughly four years as teacher of physiology and materia medica and physician. And see how I spelt it, the old style Dhaka. And it is now spelled, as you know, as D-H-A-K-A. And this Dhaka Medical School is now known as Dhaka Medical College. And he returned to Calcutta permanently and joined the Campbell Medical School in 1905 as teacher of medicine and first physician. Now, this was initially known as Shialda Medical School because it is located just near to Shialda Railway Station. And later, as you know already, that Campbell Medical School became known as NRS or Neil Ratan Sharkar Medical College. And this is one of those old buildings that is present on the campus of NRS Medical College from the time when Ewan Brahmachari was working there. And it is here, uh, you know, that he discovered urea stibabin. He, he, you know, uh, spent the lion's share of his, uh, you know, career here almost 20 years. In 1923, he joined the Calcutta Medical College as an additional physician. And he stayed there till 1927 when he retired from government medical service and he joined the Carmichael Medical College and as the professor of tropical diseases. And, uh, you know, this was established by Radha Govind Nokor. That's why it is now called R.G. Kaur Medical College after Radha Govind Nokor. So while he was, uh, you know, working at these institutions, he was also associated with other places. W one of these were this one, the National Medical Institute 
he was in charge of the top, tropical disease ward and uh, mm, uh, there were in fact two medical institutes in calcutta at that time one was this one national medical institute and the other was calcutta medical institute and this were uh, eventually merged and became what we now know as calcutta national medical college and you, this old building this is has been renovated and it's currently in pristine condition this is located on the campus of the calcutta national medical college and you can tell that this is from the british period you can see the roman arches here typical of british architecture these sunscreens the shades these are british uh, architecture even the you know large cornice this is also of british origin so this is from the time that even bromochari was working there he was also a member of the council at the calcutta school of tropical medicine you can see here cstm on the background and here you can see the Calca the carmichael hospital for tropical diseases where all the you know uh, patients suffering from tropical diseases were admitted including kalazar patients next i'll talk about his foray into science and this person sir general bomford influenced him uh, the most in taking up research while uh, you know even bromachari was doing his lms and uh, his mb uh, at uh, calcutta medical college sir bomford was the principal there he later became the director general and surgeon general of the indian medical services and it was he who noticed the spark in even bromachari that he would excel in research if he was given the opportunity and it was sir bomford who offered even bromachari the position of teacher of physiology and materia medica at dhaka medical school as i just highlighted and without sir bomford maybe we would not have got even bromachari the physician scientist maybe he would only have been even bromachari the physician while at the dhaka medical school he came in contact with sir robert neil campbell and he was the superintendent at dhaka medical school and they started a collaboration you know with his research and uh, they collaborated together and one of the his discoveries uh, was uh, a new species of anopheles mosquito anopheles as you know particularly anopheles stephensi is a major vector of malaria in calcutta and other parts of india and this was the mosquito that he discovered and it has been published in the calcutta medical gazette and it resembles mysomia listoni and he also studied the habitats of these mosquitoes and he found that they preferred to lay eggs in the shaded water and on narrow drains the drains were largely open at that time nowadays you know most of them are covered he also did research on many infectious diseases for example he worked on malaria he worked on a particular rare type of fever called quartan fever malarial fever has three patterns one which occurs every day that is called quotidian fever one which occurs every 3 days this is called tertian fever and another one this one which occurs every 4 days is the quartan fever now he identified quartan fever not only in calcutta but also in dhaka this just goes to show that he was working simultaneously in dhaka as well as in calcutta he also studied influenza he also studied filariasis this is commonly called elephantiasis because the affected leg resembles that of elephant's leg he also studied leprosy so look at the multitude of pathogens that he studied malaria it's a parasitic disease influenza is a viral disease filariasis is caused by a worm and leprosy is caused by a bacterium to be uh, more specific mycobacterium leprae so various types of pathogens he has worked with other diseases that he worked on included black water fever this is characterized by chills high fever vomiting and darkening of urine since the urine became blackish in color that's why this disease was called black water fever and it was even bromachari who you know noticed that in the acute phase of the disease uh, there was profuse hemolysis in the liver 
and he in fact used he used his knowledge of chemistry to develop an antihemolytic agent using quinine and that was the mainstay of treatment for blackwater disease at that time and uh, you know he also worked on a nervous disease that is cerebrospinal meningitis meninges as you know is the coating of the brain it has three layers on the outer layer next to the skull is the dura mater in the middle layer it is the arachnoid mater and the layer inner layer next to the cerebrum this is the pia mater and when this become inflamed you know that is called meningitis and bacterial meningitis is especially deadly it kills and say in cerebrospinal meningitis the inflammation spreads to the spinal cord as well he even studied a sexually transmitted disease syphilis which is caused by treponema pallidum i would like to highlight a particular type of fever called bardwan fever which used to be known as epidemic fever of lower bengal and it occurred in bardwan town this is the district capital of bardwan district and it is about 100 kilometers northwest of uh, calcutta and nearby cities include durgapur and bakuda and uh, talking of bardwan you know it used to be known as the granary of bengal because the highest yield of paddy came from bardwan and in bardwan town the major landmark is karzan's gate named after lord karzan coming to the disease it was prevalent in bardwan in the 19th century meaning around 1800s uh, when un brahmachari was around and it was un brahmachari who first identified that bardwan fever occurs occurred due to a double infection with malaria and kalazar symptoms included fever headache body ache and fatigue and treatment was usually with quinine coming to kalazar this is technically called visceral leishmaniasis it is so called because you get these black type of markings in the face and other parts of the body and you you can get fever as well it is not high grade fever it doesn't have a particular pattern like malaria it is sort of erratic type of fever uh, irregular fever and since uh, kala means black and azar is derived from bengali word jor it's called uh, uh, kalazar is also known as black fever and you can get these types of eruptions in the skin due to the infection by the pathogen coming to leishmaniasis there are three types of leishmaniasis one is this visceral leishmaniasis which is so called because it affects the viscera visceral organs and it this is the kalazar actually that i'm talking about and it the cardinal features of this is hepatosplenomegaly hepato meaning that which pertains to the liver spleno means that which pertains to the spleen and megaly means enlargement so this is characterized by enlargement of the liver and spleen and that is why you get this type of bloated uh, tummy uh, due to enlargement of these organs there is also another type called cutaneous leishmaniasis cutaneous as you know pertains to the skin uh, this type of eruptions you can get and there is also another disfiguring type of leishmaniasis called mucocutaneous leishmaniasis this only not only affects the skin but also the mucus lining here you can see the lining of the nasal cavity is degraded even the septum that separates the two nostrils is degraded so it's it it is highly disfiguring looking at the parasite you know there are two stages in the life cycle one is the promastigotes which occurs in the sand fly and there is the amastigotes which occurs in the host usually humans and uh, the the vector that is the uh, this is the sand fly which spreads the disease from the reservoir host to the uh, you know humans and other uh, animals uh, uh, and this is called sand fly because of the sand like coloration of its body scientifically it is known as phlebotomus argentipes and i did some minus uh, you know epidemiological studies on sand flies and uh, you know our group found that uh, this is during my phd i used to work a little bit on kalazar as well and uh, we found that the cattle sheds in the cattle sheds they, these were concentrated and cattle acted as a major reservoir in calcutta although there are other animals also 
like dogs, etc., who act as reservoir hosts. Coming to the discovery of Lishmania donovani, uh, it was discovered both by William Lishman as well as Charles Donovan. Coming to the discovery of the uh, Lishmania parasites by Lishman, uh, the story starts in Damdam. Damdam is a municipality in North Calcutta, and there is a gun and shell factory there where guns are manufactured and ammunition are also manufactured. And since the British period, it is existing. And they used to test these, uh, fire these guns and test them. And, and the sound that there was made was, you know, it's like dum dum type of sound. So that's how the name dum dum came into being. And the major landmark is Lord Clive's house here. You can see it's in a dilapidated condition and in want of repair, but it has been taken over by illegal occupants. So the story goes that a British soldier fell ill, you know, in Dum Dum. And uh, that is the reason why the sometimes Kalazar is also called Dum Dum fever. And he fell so ill after infection with Kalazar, he, he could not be treated here. So he was shifted to England and he was admitted to the army medical school at Netley. Netley is a small town in the south of England in the county of Hampshire and the nearby large, largest city is Southampton. So William Lishman was working here at that time and he was seeing to the patient, uh, but, but the patient eventually died and autopsy was performed. And William Lishman uses, used a special type of stain called Lishman stain that he developed himself and he stained the tissues and identified the pathogen. Being physiologists, all, all of you almost will have used Lishman stain sometime or another in your histology studies. So, you know, uh, at the same time, at the Government General Hospital in Madras, this is now known as uh, Chennai, uh, you know, Charles Donovan identified this parasite as well. So naturally, a controversy arose and there was much debate as to who should get the credit for this discovery. Should it be William Lishman or should it be Charles Donovan? So eventually, this was referred to uh, Sir Ronald Ross, who was the big guy at that time, you know, in tropical medicine. And you must be knowing that he won the Nobel Prize for showing that mosquitoes transmitted malaria. So looking at his deductive reasoning, he says, Lishman and Donovan both discovered the parasite. So both discovered these independently and simultaneously. Both had contributed equally. So both should get the credit. So he thought about this and he coined the term Lishmania Donovani for the pathogen. So Lishmania, because it, he is honoring William Lishman and Donovani, because he is honoring Charles Donovan. So this is how the name of the parasite came into being. Looking at the life cycle of Lishmania donovani, it has two hosts, as I mentioned. In the sandfly host, the promasticotes develop in the gut, and they, after developing, they enter the proboscis. The proboscis is the apparatus in sandfly as well as in mosquitoes that are used to inject and take out blood when they are having a blood meal. So when the sandfly takes a blood meal, uh, some of the promastigotes are introduced and in the human host, these are phagocytosed by the macrophages and they start multiplying and they eventually differentiate into amastigotes. And when these amastigotes are circulating in the body, again, when the sandfly takes a blood meal, some of the amastigotes enter the body of the sandfly and then again differentiates into promastigotes. So this is this occurs cyclically. And besides human hosts, there, are, there can be other animal hosts also. Looking at the epidemiology of Kalazar, you can see it is distributed primarily in the tropical uh, climes and some of it in the you know temperate regions as well. It is mainly concentrated in India. In, in uh, uh, the, this is the great horn of Africa because it resembles the horn of a rhinoceros. Here, the countries where it is distributed include Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Uganda. And it is also prevalent in Brazil. 
If we look at the distribution of Leishmania donovan, you can see it is present in India, in China, in the Middle East, as well as in the Great Horn of Africa. Now let's have a look what happens when we superimpose this with the vector, that is the sand fly. See, when we impose, superimpose it, we can see there's a double, double you know, uh, occurrence of both the parasite as well as the vector. So these are ripe conditions for explosive outbreaks of Kalazar, as used to happen during the time of even Brahmachari. This is, a, however, a recent, you know, uh, data from 2020 from WHO. Nowadays, uh, outbreaks do happen, but not explosive outbreaks. It is primarily confined to the, you know, extremely poor people, poorest of the poor who live in bad conditions. It occurs among them. So coming to Sir Ivan Brahmachari's contribution to Kalazar research, uh, you know, he uh, studied many things, uh, as I highlighted earlier. But as a child, he even saw many Kalazar patients dried, dying actually in front of him. And he had a, you know, uh, wish that he should do something about uh, Kalazar. So uh, his, uh, you know, he discovered a particular form of cutaneous leishmaniasis. This he termed as dermal leishmanoid. And the patient looks like this. And let's see what he says in his own words. He says that on the face, there are papillomatous nodules. These nodules here, these are the papillomatous nodules. He goes on to say that there is a slight erythematous appearance in the cheeks and forehead. Erythema means reddish coloration. Here you can see in the cheeks and in the forehead also. And he says, on the trunk and upper and lower extremities, highly raised brown patches are there. These are all the brown patches that are present. And, uh, you know, uh, he also says there are a few papules. These are the papules. This is a papule. This is a papule. This one is a papule. And uh, he also coined, this is how he coined the term, dermal leishmaniasis. He studied the LD bodies under the microscope. LD bodies are the Lishmania Donovani bodies. And he says, you know, that uh, uh, these are found mainly in the papillomatous nodules in the among these uh, brownish patches. These small nodules that I highlighted, uh, these are the papillomatous nodules. And he goes on to say that, uh, you know, in view of the fact that the eruptions are due to Lishmania infection, I propose to call this form of cutaneous leishmaniasis as dermal leishmanoid. And this was published, this uh, uh, micro microscope slide along with the patient's figure in the Indian Medical Gazette. This disease still persists. It's known as post colazard dermal leishmaniasis or PKDL. And it is characterized by these types of eruptions and it's quite disfiguring also. He also discovered the first diagnostic test for Kalazar. He named this test globulin precipitation test. He uh, did this study between September and December in 1917. And what he did was he took blood from not only Kalazar patients, but also other patients, for example, TB, malaria, and dengue patients. And what he did, he added four volumes of distilled water to one volume of blood. He found that there was flocculation, but this was non-specific, meaning that flocculation occurred not only in case of blood in which uh, the four volumes of distilled water uh, was added, blood from Kalazar patients, it also occurred, flocculation also occurred in case of blood, uh, you know, uh, from TB, malaria and dengue patients. This observation was made in September 1917. And he thought about this and he worked on it for a few months. And he found that when he reduced the volume of distilled water from four volumes to two volumes, he found that the flocculation was specific for Kalazar, meaning that when he took blood from Kalazar patients and added two volumes of distilled water, flocculation occurred. But when blood from TB, malaria and dengue patients were taken, and water was added to volumes of distilled water, flocculation did not occur. 
So this was specific for Kalazar. And this observation was in De December 1917. So see, this is more than 100 years ago. Yet what did he have at his disposal? Just test tubes. So, you know, we, we cannot go a step forward without high-end technology and fancy equipment. But see, 100 years earlier, he used his brain and he used his intellect and a lot of uh, thinking to develop this very simple test. And his knowledge of chemistry, you know, came into uh, use, especially during the discovery of urea stibamine. So, you know, on the one hand, he was a chemist and he used that to discover urea stibamine. And on the other hand, he was a doctor. So he could, he could test his drug in, uh, in Kalazar patients. So he linked these two dis disciplines effortlessly. He could be a chemist and he could be a medical person. He could put on both hats at any time. So looking at the idea of uh, the genesis of the idea of urea stibamine, uh, we come to Paul Elric's magic bullet, which was called Salvarsen. And Paul Elric, you might remember, is responsible for the side chain uh, theory for antibody production. And he shared the Nobel Prize with the Russian scientist Eli Machnikov, who first described phagocytes, phag uh, macrophages and the process of phagocytosis. Now, if we look at the structure of uh, Salvarsen, this is also called atoxical or arsenalic acid. You have an amino group at the para position. If you remember your chemistry, you'll know this is the ortho position, this is meta position, this is para position. So what do you have? You have a para aminophenyl arsenalic acid. So this is arsenic. And when they tested this in uh, syphilis patients, they were cured miraculously. That's why these were this was called a magic bullet. However, when these were tested in, uh, this was tested in Kalazar patients, it was highly toxic. And at that time, before the advent of uh, urea stibamine, there was another drug called tartar emetic. And this is chemically known as antimony potassium tartrate. Emetic, you know, emetic means that which causes a drug that causes vomiting. It initiates vomiting. Although we are more familiar with antiemetics, that is drugs that prevent, uh, you know, vomiting, like, for example, metaclopramine, ondacentron, etc. Now, they used to inject tartar emetic in, intravenously into these Kalazar patients, but it caused tremendous pain. And there was very less compliance with the patients, and they were reluctant to take this drug. Now, in order to solve this problem, uh, you know, uh, even Brahmachari thought about this, and he used his knowledge of chemistry to modify this structure. He kept the parent structure the same. If we superimpose this, we can see that the parent structure is the same. But he replaced the arsenic with antimony. SB is antimony. So it was para uh, stibnic acid. So this is stibamine. And he added urea at uh, other end also, uh, you know, for the reason simple reason that urea has anesthetic properties and this would overcome the pain that was caused by tartar emetic so you know the formula is ch4n2o you can see the four hydrogens here two nitrogens here and the oxygen here and the valency of carbon is also satisfied one two three four that is four is the valency so stibamine is uh, this uh, urea, since urea was present and stibnic acid, the stibamine was present. It was called urea stibamine. And when this was tested in Kalazar patients, it was, you know, uh, non-toxic and it was, it cured these Kalazar patients miraculously. So, you know, just like El, uh, uh, Paul Elric's uh, magic bullet, you could say that this is Brahmachari's magic bullet, urea stibamine. Some facts and figures, he worked tirelessly uh, to develop this cost-effective treatment. He synthesized urea stibamine in 1920. And this was before the discovery of the first antibiotic penicillin, which was discovered in 1928. And if you remember the story 
you know, this was a chance discovery by Alexander Fleming. The major part of the research was, you know, that was the chemical synthesis uh, of penicillin. This was done by two other scientists, that is Howard Florey and Ernst Chain. And all three, dis, you know, shared the Nobel Prize. Uh, whereas Ewan Brahmachari, despite his, you know, hard work, and despite saving so many lives, which I'll come to in a moment, he was not awarded the Nobel Prize, which I all, will also talk about. He also standardized the regimen for urea stibamine at 1.5 grams. And the mortality rate was re reduced from 95% in 1923 to the just 7% in 1936. So tremendous, you know, dramatic decrease in mortality rate. And ureostibamine was not only used in India, but also in Greece, France, and China. I call this that forgotten room. This is the room in which UN Brahmachari made his seminal discovery of ureostibamine. This is in the Campbell Hospital, now the NRS Medical College. And you'll find this photo in the treatise on Kalazar. The room is still there, but the great man is no more. His research was very painstaking and arduous, yet the, his zest for research, his love and his devotion for research never dimmed in spite of all the hurdles that he had to face. This is expressed in what he writes. He says, I shall never forget that room where urea stibamine was discovered, the room where I had to labor for months without a gas point or a water tap and where, where I had to remain contented with an old kerosene lamp for my work at night. To me, it will ever remain a place of pilgrimage where the first light of Udias Tivamine dawned upon my mind. See, he calls this place a you know, place of pilgrimage, a place of worship. This, you know, I read this in Pelza's microbiology once, a, once upon a time. Uh, that uh, UN, uh, the, that uh, Louis Pasteur referred to a lab as a sacred place, a place of worship. So this is echoed by UN Brahmachari as a place of pilgrimage. You know, so they these great scientists they regarded their place of work, you know, as a place of worship. These are holy places to them, and we should inculcate these types of attitude. Uh, towards uh, to the labs where we work. This is just a you know product insert uh, you know with all the features of urea stevamine. This was published in the Calcutta Medical Journal, and uh, UN Brahmachari also treated himself you know Kalazar patients with urea stevamine. Let's see the example of this. You can see here. Before treatment, there are there is so much deformity is there, but after treatment, you can see this is resolved. By and large, this is resolved. So this drug was very effective at that time, and uh, it cured Kalazar patients. And Yuvan Brahmachari received much praise, uh, you know, and accolades for his work. And uh, one particular person was Dr. Henry Edward Short. He was chairman of the Indian Kalazar Commission at that time. He writes that it was a dramatic success. Overnight, a death rate of 90% was transformed into a cure rate of 90%. So whereas 90% people died before the introduction of urea stibamine, uh, after introduction of urea stibamine, 90% survived. So this is, uh, you know, miraculous. Another person who praised uh, UN Brahmachari was Sir John Henry Kerr. He was the governor of Assam in British India. He writes, the progress in the campaign against Kalazar in Assam has been phenomenally rapid. Dr. Brahmachari's research in the treatment of Kalazar was one of the most outstanding contributions in the tropical therapeutics as a result of which three lakhs of human lives were saved in the province of Assam alone during the course of 10 years. So if he saved the lives of three lakhs of his countrymen in Assam alone, imagine how many lives he saved across India. Some of the notable works during his career include studies in hemolysis. This was based on his uh, PhD thesis. It was published by Calcutta University 
in 1913. This book uh, at least used to be available at the Calcutta University sales counter. I had purchased one uh, 30 years ago. Uh, so it might still be available there. His treatise on Kalajar and his Kalajar, its treatment, these were standard textbooks for tropical medicine students studying MD. And his gleanings from my researches, these are the highlights of his researches that he carried out over the years. So I'll come to a sad phase uh, in his life. Two incidents I will uh, highlight. First, uh, not getting the fellowship of the Royal Society. The Royal Society is one of the oldest and arguably the most prestig prestigious society uh, in the area of science. It was established way back in 1660, you know, uh, many, many, many centuries ago. And they were leading figures, you know, who were presidents. For example, the 12th president was none other than uh, Sir Isaac Newton. So, you know, and the fellowship to this society is one of the most prestigious fellowships on the planet. So why didn't he get the FRS? You know, was it politics? Could have been. Magnat Sar did his very best to get nominations and he succeeded in getting many nominations. Santishar of Bhatnagar initially, you know, uh, said that who, he would support him but later withdraw his support as did J.L. Simonson. Two other uh, scientists, leading scientists at that time, Indian scientists, were K.N. Krishnan and Birbal Sahani. They were, they also nominated him. There were others also, Britishers. And I'm sure as physiologists, you remember F.G. Donnan. You must be remembering Donnan membrane equilibrium from your studies. And uh, there were two people, W.H. Uh, Gray and especially Sir Leonard Rogers, uh, you know, who openly opposed his nomination. Sir Leonard Rogers was the founder of the Calcutta School of Tropical Medicine, which I'll talk about later. And he did an open propaganda against him and much of this was false. He, he published a letter and which, you know, uh, uh, made the Britishers set up and take notice. Whereas Yuvan Pramachari, when he sent two letters to, you know, uh, uh, nature, uh, it was largely, you know, uh, went unnoticed. And the examiners of these uh, nominations were primarily chemists. So they laid more weightage on the chemistry and less weightage on the lives that uh, these drugs should save. Coming to S.S. Bhatnagar's uh, reluctance, you can see, I just want to highlight one thing. He wrote a letter to A.V. Hill, who was then the secretary of the Royal Society. He writes that I sincerely hope that the council will see its way in nominating him this year. So he cleverly says, says that the council will see its way. He doesn't say that he will himself nominate Yuan Brahmachari. So that's exactly what, what happened. He didn't sign the nomination papers. Or, uh, or was it sheer bad luck? See, you Magnatsar did his level best to get the nominations. And he even wrote to Henry Dale, Sir Henry Dale, who was then the president of the Royal Society. And by the way, all of you must have used the Dale's bath in your experimental physiology uh, you know, labs. This was uh, developed by Sir Henry Dale. And uh, yeah. Magnatsa wrote a letter. And in this letter, he highlights that although other people assisted him in his research, the, he writes that the Kalazar remedy, urea stebamine, seems to have uh, been made by Brahmachari himself. Why did he use the word seems? Because of the fact that he was not a biologist, he was not a medical person. So just he was an astrophysicist. So by reading the papers uh, published by uh, UN Brahmachari, he, it seemed to him that urea stevamine was discovered by himself. That is UN Brahmachari by himself. Another, you know, controversial area is his not getting the Nobel Prize. So prevalent theories at that time was being a native Indian. Maybe there was racial discrimination. He had no research exposure abroad. 
he worked in india all all throughout his life as a result he was largely unknown to the nobel committee and he had no contacts abroad and there was no one to lobby for him either i was going through the nobel prize website and i saw this data you know on the basis of which i asked the question whether these were weak nominations in 1929 there were 121 nominations in all in the area of physiology or medicine and un bromochari received one nomination from sudhamay ghosh and in 1942 there were a total of 50 nominations in the category of physiology or medicine and he received five nominations of these people we only remember shubhosh chandra mohalanabis firstly because he was the founder of the physiological society of india along with brahmachari and others and he was the first president also of the physiological society of india that's why we remember him but the others as for the others you know by and large their names have gone into oblivion we don't remember them that is why you know maybe his nominations were weak whereas if we look at cv raman you know he had a godfather to give that extra boost boost which you know uh, even brahmachari did not have we know that he won the 1930 nobel prize in physics and look at his nominator it was none other than sir ernst rutherford who himself was a nobel laureate he received the 1908 nobel prize in chemistry so had even brahmachari has received had had a godfather and received a nomination nominator uh, you know who was a nobel laureate maybe he would have stood a better chance of winning the nobel prize so if he had won he would have been the first nobel laureate from india uh, to have won the nobel prize in the category of physiology or medicine one indian did win the nobel prize or indian origin uh, uh, he was hargobind khorana but the prize went to america because he was an american citizen coming to his achievements major awards included the thwaites medal as i highlighted in one of my first slides that for standing first in mathematics he was awarded the thwaites medal in his ba exam he was also awarded the pinto medal this is one of the highest awards by the calcutta school of tropical medicine he got this in 1921 and in 1924 he was awarded the kesari hind gold medal which is also a prestigious award awarded by the emperor himself he received three fellowships one was the 1915 the fellow of the royal society of medicine or frsm in 1921 he became fellow of the asiatic society of bengal and this is how it looked at that time and in 1935 he became founder fellow of the national institute of sciences of india and this is now known as the indian national science academy and it is the most prestigious science academy of the three science academies that are there in india and the you know prestigious fellowship is known as fna he also he held two distinguished titles in 1924 he was awarded rai bahadur by the emperor of the british empire and in 1935 he was knighted he received knighthood and this is his uh, citation knight, knighthood citation and it is addressed to rai bahadur upendranath brahmachari but after being awarded knighthood he was more popularly known as sir even brahmachari as we know him now he also held many distinguished positions he was elected president of the uh, uh, asiatic society of bengal in 1928 and in 1932 he became president of the so society of biological chemists or as we see this is an age old uh, society and it's still functioning to this day in 1935 he became chairman of the indian red cross society you know this is largely because of the fact that he started established the first blood bank in india at the calcutta school of tropical medicine the following year in 1936 he was elected president of the indian chemical society and rightly so because there was there was no other person as knowledgeable as him at that time in the area of chemistry and this uh, prestigious society was established by none other than uh, acharya prafulla chandra rai the same year he was elected as the general president 
of the 23rd session of the Indian Science Congress, which was held in Indore. This is the highest, uh, you know, prestigious award uh, position that you can get in the Indian Science Congress Association. And in 1942, he was elected as the president of the Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science or IACS. And this was present uh, in for initially at Bobazar when uh, you, you, C.V. Raman was doing his experiments. Later, as you know, it has been now shifted to Jadapur. And during this time, he donated a lot of uh, money to IACS. Kolkata also pay, paid its tribute uh, to even Brahmachari. Uh, this is his house in the erstwhile Loudon Street. And it was in this house that his sons, Honindranath and uh, Nirmal Kumar, helped his father to establish the Brahmachari Research Institute in, around 1924-25. It functioned uh, very nicely. Uh, you know, they were developing cheaper versions of UDS tibamin, uh, which now we call actually uh, generic drugs, so to speak. And it was functioning very well until 1962 when it shut down abruptly. And you can see the street, Loudon Street, has been named as Sir Ivan Brahmachari Sharani. And this is his house. And this is also a famous street, Park Street, which has also been renamed after Mother Teresa. Now I'll just end. This is uh, the last two or three slides. I'm talking about a day that I still remember and that is close to my heart. I'm talking about today. That is the birthday of Sir Ewan Brahmachari almost three decades ago. So I was a PhD scholar at the, that time at the Calcutta School of Tropical Medicine. And the Britishers, you know, they built three schools of tropical medicine in the British Empire. The first one was the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. It was established in 1898. The following year in 1899, the London School of Tropical Medicine was established. And later its name was changed to London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And the third one was this one, uh, the Calcutta School. It was established in 1914 by Sir Leonard Rogers. He's the person who had an open clash with Sir Ewan Brahmachari, you know, regarding the uh, nominations for FRS, as I told you. And as you enter through the door of uh, Calcutta School of Tropical Medicine, you see these two busts on pedestals. This is of Sir Ewan, uh, the, of Sir Leonard Rogers, and this one of Sir Ewan Brahmachari. And what I saw was Sir Leonard Rogers' birthday was always celebrated with much fanfare and opulence, whereas Ewan Brahmachari's birthday was not celebrated at all. So this, you know, saddened me deeply because even that time I knew that Ewan Brahmachari was a, a, a very talented scientist. So I thought about this and, uh, you know, thought that maybe it was British period around 1914. So, you know, he was a leading figure at that time in tropical. That's why his birthday was celebrated there and not uh, Ewan Brahmachari because he is basically a native as the British has called us at that time. But the sad thing is that this trend followed even after uh, independence. So, you know, it came to my mind, uh, we should celebrate Ewan Brahmachari's birthday. And if, we, if you come out of uh, tropical, they, this is separated from Calcutta uh, uh, Medical College just by a gate. If you go through the gate on the right hand side will be the pres principal's block. And if you go straight out, you come into uh, College Street. And if you turn right, you come onto this street, Bobaza Street. It was a, a you know sunny morning, but chilly morning. And if you walk down Bobaza Street, you find this uh, temple. This is a sheep temple, which people who are in Calcutta will know. And as, a, as soon as I reached Bow Bazaar, I went to the Bow Bazaar flower market, purchased a garland of rajining on the flowers and a packet of incense sticks. So, you know, uh, this is all I could afford actually uh, at that time. And uh, uh, after this, I walked back to uh, Calcutta Tropical and went to Professor P.K. Sharkar's chamber. He was then the director of, the, of CSTM and head of the Department of Pharmacology. And at the same time, he was also the drug, drug controller of West Bengal. Uh, and the little pharmacology that I know, I learned from him. So I told him, sir, we are going to celebrate you and Brahmachari's birthday today. 
and you will have to garland the bust and you will have to say a few words about him. So he agreed and he was very enthusiastic. He said, oh, okay, I'll make the arrangements. And he had the foyer decorated like this with flowers, as is done in most cases while celebrating the foundation day and other you know, uh, ceremonies. So, you know, he gave the speech and he garlanded the bust. And this is how, you know, the birthday of Sir Yuen Brahmachari was celebrated for the very first time at the Calcutta School of Tropical Medicine, just with the garland of Rajini on the flowers and a packet of incense sticks. Thank you very much for your attention. Atishtha, uh, Atishtha, I am not going to unmute Kuttal. Please also, unmute also, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I thank uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Varti for accepting our invitation and giving uh, such a thought-provoking talk on legendary Sir Upendrana Brahmachari. And uh, uh, we really moved uh, uh, when we are just uh, hearing and seeing the slides also in such a depth uh, he dealt with uh, with the life with the struggle of uh, such an eminent scientist and not only that uh, we we only know regarding the kalajar and urea stibami and uh, uh, and but he uh, he uh, uh, he actually focused on other aspects of uh, of uh, of the research work of that legendary figure and the struggle. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Bharati. And now uh, it's uh, open for uh, uh, some uh, question or interaction. Uh, the talk is open. If there is any question, you can ask uh, uh, in front of uh, the expert on that particular field. Is there any question? <clears throat> so I am seeing here one uh, that is, is there any comment from Acharya PC Rai for his student Brahmachari after discovery of Urea Stibami? I'm seeing in the, uh, in the, yeah. Anyway, so um, I now request uh, Professor Prasun Priyo Naik, Professor of Physiology, Ames Jodhpur, uh, and one of the Vice Presidents of uh, our society, the Physiological Society of India, uh, to, to uh, give, uh, uh, give a vote of thanks and conclude uh, today's program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Atish Chattopadhyay. Thank you very much for hosting the session. And uh, it was it was a, indeed a very good session we had for last uh, two hours nearly. And uh, <clears throat> I, on behalf of the Education Committee of the Physiological Society of India, I wish to convey my sincere thanks to the society for making this platform available and we we are uh, joining this platform to have some online lecture series along with that we have initiated this and uh, the we have commemorated we have celebrated the birthday of uh, 150th birthday of uh, sari uen brahmachari I convey my sincere thank to President Sir, Honorable President, Professor Amar Kumar Chandra, President of Honorable President of Physiological Society of India, 
and uh, <coughs> our uh, executive body member, Professor Krishna Roy, Professor uh, Samal Roy, for their very insightful updating about Sir Yuan Brahmachari. In fact, with this uh, commemoration, with these, we really bring forward the unforgotten, means forgotten hero scientists of India who were nominated in Nobel. And uh, I convey my sincere thanks to Dr. Kausik Bharati, so nice and informative discussion about uh, Professor Sir Yuan Brahmachari's life and his research. And uh, the best part of the lecture was best part of this talk, talk was that it was so nicely oriented, starting from the history of surname Brahmachari. It's a, uh, as uh, Dr. Bharati has mentioned, it's a rare name, surname. And uh, starting from dating that how this surname came and uh, he took to the Badre celebration in the institutes in the, in the Calcutta School of Tropical Medicine and today. And it's a, we are privileged to join in this group in this uh, session today to pay our respect, tribute to Sir Yuan Brahmachari. I also thank all the audience who were present throughout the session and uh, some encouraging words also we have received from them. So in addition to this, the technical support we have received from Dr. Vinay Chaturi. I also wish to thank him. Overall, on and all, everyone, all the speakers, all the guest speakers, uh, guest of honor, uh, particularly Professor Krishna Roy, Professor Samuel Roy, Dr. Kyosik Bharati, Professor Atish Chatterjee, and obviously our big support from Honorary General Secretary Dr. Rajan Haldar and Treasurer of the Society, Dr. Sritiratan Tripathi. Thank you, one and all. Before we close the session, I just would like to remind you that the next Saturday, 23rd, we will be having series as uh, as ongoing series going uh, on physiology lectures going on. We will be having lectures on digestive system by Dr. Barnali Rebasu and Dr. Arjun Moitra. Please join us and uh, if possible, share your feedback so that if there are some uh, lacunae, if uh, we can improve our presentations, if we can improve our uh, communication, that will be a great help. Thank you one and all. So that's all. Thank you. I would... Uh, any sir sir thank you <laughs> thank you the it is a wonderful session the speakers were excellent uh, they explored in details about uh, sir even gomochari and psi has organized it in a nice way i do not i have no idea regarding the number of participants Whatever it may be, those who have those who are present, they became rich to see the work of an Indian scientist. Basically, he is originally an Indian, though he may not be a Nobel Prize awardee. However, he, he is in the mind of all the scientists of the country. Thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Kusum Thank you. Dr. Kousi Bharati, thank thanks to Dr. Samuel Roy, Dr. Krishna Roy, and all. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. So, uh, Dr. Kosek, you would like to say something? Me, unmute yourself, please. Unmute. I would just like to express my deep gratitude to my uh, to the Physiological Society of India and everybody associated with it, including uh, you know uh, Professor Amur Chandra, the President, uh, Professor Krishna Roy, uh, Dr. Shamal Roy, and all our friends and colleagues at the PSI Education Committee including yourself, uh, Dr. Smriti Ratan Prithati and Dr. Uh, Rajan Haldar. And I thank the audience for kindly bearing with me. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Gosik. Thank you. So that's, the, that's all from our session today. Thank you, everyone.